Hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to Triple N Media Cardiology Lectures I am Dr Nick Nickam in this presentation we are going to look at uh, acute coronary syndrome diagnosis and management this is a quick overview of uh, acute coronary syndrome or ACS and its management chest pain can be caused by a multitude of factors the most frequent cause of a chest pain in adult population is non specific that is 50% of the people who come to the emergency room have chest pain which is usually not related to the coronary artery disease but in a cardiac population coronary artery disease is one of the most frequent causes of a chest pain that is the atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries causing the occlusion with the reduced blood supply to the region beyond the obstruction which results in angina which is chest pain brought on by exertion if the stenosis is critical the chest pain could occur at rest coronary artery disease is not the only thing that causes a chest pain in the adult population a whole host of other things within the heart can ch cause chest pain in addition to causes outside the heart which we will talk about in a minute within the heart the chest pain can be related to valvular heart disease like aortic stenosis it could be related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or uh, infiltrative cardiomyopathy it may be related to aortic dissection it may be related to right ventricular strain from pulmonary hypertension or it could be related to pericarditis and myocarditis so these are some of the unusual conditions that can cause chest pain in a given population now let's look at some of the causes outside the heart that can cause chest pain or mimic angina of course patients who are having pleurisy can have pleuritic chest pain which can present as uh, pericarditis along with ekg changes of pericarditis it may also be related to esophagitis esophageal hernia or esophageal spasm there are esophageal ulceration that can cause chest pain which mimics cardiac pain patients with gallbladder attacks can also present with symptoms similar to a heart attack or angina pectoris gastritis can mimic chest pain in addition to that rarely in young patients we can have pneumothorax which can present with the severe chest pain one of the deadliest uh, problems related to the lungs would be pulmonary embolus in patients with deep venous thrombosis or with no history of deep venous thrombosis that can cause chest pain so there are a whole host of conditions that cause chest pain majority of the chest pain that presents to the emergency room is non cardiac the question is how do we differentiate a patient with a cardiac chest pain versus a patient with a non cardiac chest pain so let's see if we can decipher this dilemma and then proceed with how we investigate these patients and how we manage these patients so here we have patients presenting with chest pain who can be categorized based on cardiac history or cardiac underlying conditions into three main categories namely low risk patients intermediate risk patients or high risk patients i'm talking about now mainly cardiac patients of course the low risk can include non specific chest pain which is the most common cause for patients presenting in the emergency room it can also be related to pleurisy pericarditis or anxiety without underlying structural heart disease it can be related to non cardiac issues like hiatal hernia acid reflux esophagitis esophageal spasm gallbladder disease peptic ulcer disease or aortic dissection the intermediate group of patients are older they have risk factors for heart disease like hyperlipidemia diabetes or hypertension they can present with chest pain with normal ekgs or abnormal ekgs 
they can present with a chest pain associated with abnormal EKGs. So how do we deal with these patients based on their pre-existing risk factors and clinical presentation with chest pain with normal or abnormal EKGs. Then we have a high risk group. These are the patients who already have underlying heart disease. Some of them had coronary artery bypass surgery or they had multiple stents in the past. They have heart failure. Maybe they have pacemakers. They may have ICDs. They have low ejection fraction and a whole host of other things associated with that like cardiac arrhythmias. When they present with chest pain, how do we deal with those patients? We are going to answer those questions. And of course, when patients present with chest pain and an acute ST elevation in two or more leads of more than two millimeters, then we are dealing with a STEMI. That's a totally different topic, which is covered in a different video. Please do watch our video on management of acute STEMI. Now let's proceed here. We're going to look at some scenarios and try to categorize these patients into low risk, intermediate risk or high risk group. Here we have a patient who is 30 years old, who presents with chest pain, no risk factors like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, smoking, family history, nothing is a normal EKG, normal troponin, and no history of uh, cardiac events in the past. Is this a low risk or a high risk patient? So this is obviously a low risk patient. So the management of this patient will be quite different from somebody with a high risk presentation. Now let's look at a 62 year old person who has chest pain, who has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, no diabetes, smoking, family history, has an abnormal EKG and abnormal troponin. And of course he had a heart surgery, yes, bypass surgery, yes. So this is a patient who is a high risk patient. So these patients need to be approached in a different manner altogether. Now let's look at another patient, 74 years old, and look at the number of uh, red dots here. He has uh, coronary artery disease, coronary artery bypass surgery, low ejection fraction. So this is like a very high risk group patient. Now let's look at a 40 year old person with uh, mild risk, with, uh, risk factors, but the rest of the things look okay, except for maybe an abnormal T wave changes on the electrocardiogram. So this is a patient who is in the intermediate risk group because we looked at the high risk groups here, these two patients. Now let's look at the last patient here, who is 75 years old. Remember, age plays a significant role when we assess the risk. Age is itself is an independent risk factor for coronary syndrome, acute coronary syndrome. So we have chest pain, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, not a smoker, no family history, abnormal EKG, normal troponins, history of bypass surgery with a preserved left ventricular function. So again, we are dealing with somebody who is a high risk patient. So based on these, we need to determine what kind of tests we need to do to pinpoint if this pain is coming from the heart. If it is coming from the heart, what kind of problem they have that is accounting for the chest pain. Let's continue and we are going to look at some of the things that we do in the emergency room setting, on the floor, on day one and on day two. It's very important to plan all these things right from the time we walk into the patient room because time is of essence, diagnosis is essence and management is essential. So, of course, we order EKGs, we look for enzymes, basically troponin, and we look at their chemistries, look at their kidney function, sugar, thyroid studies, and echocardiogram is not necessarily needed in every patient. However, if they are intermediate or high risk group, an echocardiogram might help us to get an idea as what their left ventricular function is, what the ref, uh, left heart size is, 
and that or if and look for any regional wall motion abnormalities ptin or is very important especially if these patients have been on blood thinners before they came to the hospital we're going to talk about a uh, little more about stress test in the next slide of course cardiac cath is uh, like one of the last tests we would order when a lot of these tests point towards significant ischemic chest pain on day one right from the emergency room we need to be taking actions that's why i am making this as a fundamental approach to acute coronary syndrome no matter how many tests we do no matter how many procedures we do or stents we put in or send them for surgery the medical management that begins with the first visit continues for the rest of the patient's life this is something which is hardly emphasized in most educational institutions because medical management of cardiac patients is of paramount importance in the long term prognosis of these patients so of course in an acute coronary syndrome we want to keep them npo nothing by mouth why because these patients can get unstable these patients may have to go for emergency cardiac catheterization they may have to go for surgery or if they for any reason develop serious arrhythmias and need cardiac uh, shock you want to keep them without any food in order to prevent any aspiration because we won't be able to do any tests if the patient's already had food oxygen is of course important pulse oximeter is a good barometer to see how much oxygen is needed all these patients routinely receive aspirin 165 to 325 mg as soon as they arrive in the emergency room but most of them already would have received the aspirin in the ambulance if they were brought by ambulance but today most people are so well versed with the significance of chest pain most of them pop an aspirin and then come to the emergency room if you put an intravenous line and maintain some maintenance fluid if the pain is significant enough you give them morphine statins have become a standard treatment starting with high intensity statins like uh, atorvastatin 80 mg or rosuvastatin 40 mg from day 1 so these are some of the very basic medications that we use in order to address a patient with chest pain of course for control of pain beyond morphine we can use nitroglycerin as a paste one inch every 6 hours if they are having ongoing chest pain they can be put on nitroglycerin intravenous infusion or we can also give longer acting sublingual nitrates but i would like to give drugs that can be controlled that can be stopped when there is an adverse uh, effect beta blockers are used in patients with uh, <coughs> beta blockers are useful generally we can use uh, like metoprolol 25 mg Uh, every 12 hours that will help to reduce the heart rate reduce the strain on the heart muscle and if it would also help to control the pain if the patients are having something more than just chest pain and a normal ekg if they present with the chest pain if they have an abnormal ekg if they have abnormal cardiac enzymes uh, then most of these patients need to be treated in addition to aspirin either heparin or lovenox if you are in a private practice setup uh, lovenox is pretty much standard where they receive 1 mg per kg every 12 hours but however if we are planning on doing a procedure you skip the morning dose that's the standard heparin is uh, given intravenously to maintain a ptt between 60 and 80 seconds plavix is an important medicine i put it down here because some of these patients may already be on plavix when they come in 
with history of coronary artery disease or patients having stents, they may already be on Plavix. So we need to be aware of what medications these patients are getting. In addition, in an acute coronary syndrome where you suspect significant coronary artery disease and possible coronary intervention, some people go ahead and load these patients with Plavix, but I generally would not recommend loading patients with Plavix until a cardiac catheterization has been done because if someone is so unstable, chances are you're going to take them to the cardiac catheterization lab and within 30 minutes you would have a diagnosis at which time you can put them on Angiomax which will get the same effect at the same time, you are not putting Plavix in these patients and if they have to go for surgery, a Plavix could cause significant bleeding problems in the post-operative period and that is why I personally do not recommend Plavix for patients going for urgent cardiac uh, angiography because they can be placed on blood thinners like Angiomax within a few minutes after they have arterial access. Of course, if you are dealing with a patients with multi-system problem like hypertension, diabetes, renal problem, and vascular problem, of course, we may need the support of renal service, especially if their creatinine is two, three, or if they are on hemodialysis. Similarly, we may need the CAT team in an acute emergency situation. EP service may not be generally needed. Uh, most of this can be handled by the general cardiologist uh, in an acute situation. And surgery consultation comes in after we have done a cardiac catheterization. And if you find like a 80% left main and a 90% right coronary obstruction, the, if surgery is the best option in these patients, then cardiac surgery may be needed. All right. Let's assume that we have a low risk patient or an intermediate risk patient who presents to the emergency room. We have admitted him to the floor and what do we do next? Of course, we're going to order diagnostic tests to look for any evidence of uh, provocable myocardial ischemia. That is, can we provoke myocardial ischemia to look for evidence of ischemia and the different regions where the ischemia may, may be coming from. So in order to do that, we want to make sure these patients are on day two kept NPO. So many times I see these patients were admitted to the hospital, next day they got their breakfast. How in the world are you going to be able to do a cardiac catheterization or a nuclear stress test or a stress echocardiogram or a dobutamine stress echo. Think about it. You, we have to be practical, we have to be prudent. Keep patients in PO on day one and day two until we have completed complete cardiovascular uh, evaluation. And of course, we're going to be testing enzymes. And if they're going for stress test, uh, we get them ready for the stress test. The stress test order should be already in on day one. If uh, the enzymes and the EKGs are normal, then you proceed with the stress test. Or you can order a stress echocardiogram. Okay, let us look at another thing I want you to keep in mind is a lot of these chronic cardiac patients who have cardiac arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, they may be on blood thinners like Pradexa or Xeralta. So those things need to be taken into account because if they are going for a procedure or if they are going to need surgery, that needs to be addressed so that we don't have excess bleeding uh, following the surgery. All right, let's talk about a little bit about stress tests. There are various kinds of stress tests that are available to diagnose and it depends upon the risk category of the patient. It depends on whether we have a normal electrocardiogram or an abnormal electrocardiogram. It depends upon whether the patient can exercise or not. It depends upon whether the patient has good echocardiographic windows or not and it depends upon whether the patient can exercise for a nuclear stress test. Anyway, uh, 
So here we have a treadmill test. If this is normal in a young person with normal EKG, normal enzymes, then we are done. We know that it is non-cardiac pain, then the patient can be worked up for other causes of chest pain. On the other hand, if a person comes with a chest pain, with non-specific non T wave changes, and the cardiac enzymes are normal, we could do a treadmill test, and if that comes back as normal, then this is non-cardiac chest pain. However, there are times when patients present with chest pain, they may have an abnormal T wave changes or maybe some ST depression, in which case uh, it, it may be not prudent to put them on a treadmill or maybe the person cannot complete the exercise test. They cannot reach the expected 85% of the predicted maximum heart rate. In those circumstances, we have to choose a different modality, preferably an imaging modality along with an exercise test if they can tolerate so that we have a better understanding of where is the ischemia and how significant is the myocardial ischemia and if that is causing the chest pain. Okay, the options available include, we can have a like a echocardiogram combined with a stress treadmill test and an echo, stress echocardiography or we can have a dobutamine uh, stress echocardiography. We rarely use vasodilator uh, echocardiography but that's also available. Then we have the option of uh, doing a, like a vasodilator nuclear stress test or a treadmill nuclear stress test. And of course, PET scan is also available, which has a much better resolution and a slightly better sensitivity and specificity, but PET scans may not be readily available in most of the institutions. So our choices would be among regular treadmill tests or a treadmill test combined with an echocardiogram or a nuclear stress test or simply a pharmacological nuclear stress test if the patient cannot tolerate the exercise. When we use dobutamine exercise test, we also need to keep in mind the limitations. First of all, we need to have good echocardiographic windows. Number two, the patient should not have significant cardiac arrhythmias like PVCs or atrial fibrillation, which will make it very difficult to administer dobutamine for a stress echocardiography. So these are some of the things that we need to keep in mind when we are choosing the appropriate stress test based on the patient's presentation. And here is a chart showing the sensitivity and specificity of each one of these stress tests and approximately how much they cost. A regular treadmill has a very low sensitivity but a normal stress test has better than 90% specificity. So if you get a normal EKG stress test at 85% of the predicted maximum heart rate, you have a good stress test. And the cost is approximately $150. Stress echocardiography is something which can be done easily. It doesn't need much preparation. However, the patient needs to be able to exercise. It has a much better sensitivity in the range of 80 to 85 percent and a better specificity, but it does cause more than the regular stress test. If the EKGs are abnormal, then this may be the next choice. Exercise uh, stress using SPECT, that is the nuclear stress test. With the exercise, we get an 87 percent uh, uh, specificity, but we are subjected to attenuation errors and processing errors. But in good hands, with CT attenuation correction, these numbers can be substantially improved. Dobutamine stress echocardiography also has 80 to 86 percent sensitivity specificity. That means it is pretty accurate in identifying any regional wall motion abnormalities, but we want to make sure this patient is safely uh, 
able to take dobutamine. If they are having abnormal EKGs, if they are having elevated enzymes, you certainly don't want to do a dobutamine stress echocardiography, which can further aggravate myocardial ischemia. Vasodilator SPECT, again, as I said, it costs about $1,800 and has a 84, 75 to 84%, but it can be improved much more by using uh, CT attenuation, which has become a standard in the present day practice. Um, of course, coronary CTA is very good, just like a regular treadmill in excluding coronary artery disease. But however, if you're dealing with a patient with a lot of coronary calcium, with a high heart rate, the accuracy goes down. Of course, it is much more economical than a nuclear stress test or a PET scan. Of course, PET scan has the best uh, specificity and sensitivity, but PET scan may not be available everywhere as readily as uh, you see them at the medical centers. All right, let us continue. There are a lot of alternative therapies available. So we need to discuss all the alternative therapies with patients before we jump into doing the test. So we need to ask ourselves, what is the appropriate test? What other tests can provide the same information with the least amount of trauma to the patient, with the least cost involved? Not everyone needs cardiac catheterization and not everyone needs a nuclear stress test if a treadmill stress test can answer the question. We need to look at the benefits and risk of every test. So think before you click. Let's take a couple of examples and see how we can apply the knowledge that we have acquired in the last 25 minutes and how to appropriately use the modalities that will help us to arrive at a diagnosis with the least amount of effort and resource utilization. Here we have a 30 year old male with a history of chest pain for two weeks. This patient is having chest pain for two weeks. We already know this is not a STEMI. This is not an acute chest pain. And so this is sort of a subacute onset of chest pain. The patient has no hypertension, smoking or hyperlipidemia, blood pressure is normal, BMI is a little bit high, EKG is normal. So now we are dealing with what kind of risk. Let's look at the risk. And this is a patient who falls in this category, which is he's a low risk. His EKG is normal. His troponins are normal. What is the test you're going to do next to find out if this chest pain is cardiac? Obviously, the test you're going to choose will be a regular treadmill test because this is a young person with no risk factors whose only problem is slight obesity. But if the stress test is normal, then we know this is not cardiac. It could be anxiety. It could be acid reflux or it could be stress. Any number of things, but not cardiac. So based on that, we can categorize what needs to be done for the patient and move on to the next one. All right, let's move on to the next one. We got a 60-year-old male with history of a chest pain for one week duration. Now the age is creeping up here. Age, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, high blood pressure, obesity, and an abnormal t -vis and the troponin is normal. All right, so here we have a like a intermediate candidate who has a higher risk for coronary artery disease and who also has flat T waves on the EKG, is obese, and we are not sure this patient can exercise on a treadmill and reach 85% of the predicted maximum heart rate. If we are not certain, we have the option of doing a stress echocardiography since the enzymes are normal and the T wave changes are non-specific, or we can do a pharmacological nuclear myocardial perfusion test to look for any evidence of myocardial ischemia, which should be associated with a CT attenuation because of his obesity which can cause inferior wall perfusion attenuation. All right, let's move on to the next 
Again, I told you he's, this is an intermediate risk patient. Our choice would be either a stress echocardiography or a perfusion scan using a pharmacological stress test. There's one more patient here. Let's look at this one. 63 years old male with history of chest pain for three days. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, high blood pressure. This one, ST depression, V4 to V6, elevated troponin levels. Now, what do you do? Would you do a regular treadmill test? No, this patient has elevated troponin levels. Number two, would you do a stress echocardiography? No, for the same reason, this patient has uh, uh, intermediate risk. This patient is obese. This patient is not able to exercise, so it's not going to help to look for evidence of ischemia. We already know his EKG is abnormal. The troponins are elevated. This patient should be going for a cardiac catheterization. Okay, let's get back to the treatment. When somebody needs to go for a cardiac catheterization, our management changes compared to a patient who has normal EKG and normal enzymes. So this patient needs to be on nitroglycerin and beta blockers if needed. Also, this patient needs to be on high dose statins. This patient needs to be started on heparin. And if you start them on Lovenox, it's one milligram per kg, Q12 hours, and skip the next morning dose. Because if you're say, taking this patient for cardiac catheterization, you need to stop the Lovenox. So that's a Plavix. A Plavix is something I would not use in this patient, even though he has abnormal EKG, elevated troponins, but the cardiac catheterization will tell us where the problem is and if it's something that can be addressed with the coronary intervention, such as putting a stent. Okay, so that's uh, the story about that patient. And let's see, oh, here we got a 75-year-old male with the chest pain and shortness of breath. Remember now, chest pain and shortness of breath for two weeks. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking. Patient had a coronary artery bypass surgery, has an ICD, left ventricular rejection fraction of 20%. My golly, we are dealing with a class 4 heart failure patient with history of coronary artery disease, bypass surgery, and a, an ICD. Blood pressure is 95 over 60. BMI is high, ST depression in B4, but the troponins are just borderline. What would you do for this patient? A stress test? A stress test is going to be not useful in patients with low ejection fraction. The main thing we are concerned here is, is there any evidence of a new blockage, either in the native vessels that were not bypassed or in the vein grafts that were bypassed? Since this patient has low ejection fraction, he's a high-risk patient, so this patient needs to be prepared for cardiac catheterization. All right, how do we prepare this patient for cardiac catheterization? This patient needs to receive all these medications, statins, oxygen, aspirin, IV fluids, morphine if necessary, but remember the blood pressure is low, the patient is short of breath, so there is a significantly compromised left ventricular function. Uh, if the patient is not on beta blockers, you don't want to start them on beta blockers at this situation. Certainly they can be on uh, nitroglycerin and of course they need to be started on heparin and if they are on other blood thinners, for atrial fibrillation like warfarin or uh, pradaxa or apexaban that needs to be held and the patient needs to be prepared for cardiac catheterization. When we do cardiac catheterization in these patients, the chances of finding a large vessel with a critical blockage may be much less than in a patient without any history of a significant coronary artery bypass surgery and stents in the past. However, if you do find a suitable size artery with an occlusion that can be opened up with a stent and continued optimization of medical treatment uh, as a long-term management. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a quick brief overview of uh, acute coronary syndrome diagnosis and management. This is like a stepping stone as to how you approach patients with acute coronary syndrome and 
what steps do you take at every level to make sure we get the optimal management with the least amount of resources used and the least amount of time spent thank you so much for watching this presentation i am dr nick nickam and please do subscribe to our youtube channel and we will see you next time Thank you.